Hi, I'm Scott Jessmore, the scheduler for the Snowbelt Youth Hockey League. First of all, thanks to everyone who volunteers as an off-ice official. And even more so, thanks for caring enough about performing your off-ice duties correctly that you're taking the time to watch this video. Parts of this presentation will focus on snowbelt situations. However, my goal is that this video should be useful for everyone who needs to fill out the score sheet. I've been wanting to make a video like this for some time. I've been the Snowbelt Scheduler for quite a while now, and I've reviewed over 4,000 different score sheets since taking the position. I had uh, more to say about this, but I'll keep the introduction brief. If you have any questions or constructive criticism about this video, feel free to email me at snowbeltscheduler at gmail.com. Thanks again. The new version of the score sheet has a similar design as the current official USA Hockey score sheet. That said, the new central section score sheet still includes the special features of the previous score sheet we've been using. So you'll still have a section reserved for remarks and you'll still have that useful shot tracker to help track your goalie saves. And most importantly, it should help avoid some of the major confusions we've had with our previous score sheet design. There are now thicker borders between the different sections and the scoring section does not perfectly align with the roster section. So hopefully parents will stop trying to line up the scoring info with the each kid's roster line. That was a common problem we've had in the past. Before I start, here are some quick tips for scorekeepers, regardless of which score sheet you're using. First things first, make sure you understand the score sheet and how to properly fill it out. Hopefully this tutorial will help you out with the new version of the score sheet. One of the best pieces of advice I can offer is to bring a notepad with you. Divide the notepad in half with a vertical line and then write each team on top of each column. Ideally, you'll wanna match the score sheet. So if you're using the new score sheet, put the home team on the left side and the away team on the right. Then when any goals or penalties are announced to you, you can quickly jot down the time, jersey number, or penalty info, or the goal, scorer, and assist jersey numbers. That way you can quickly get all the information recorded, but then you can transfer the details neatly on the official score sheet once you're sure you have all the information. This is even more important if you are stuck as both the scorekeeper and timekeeper, trying to set the penalties on the clock and write all the penalty information down on the score sheet all before the refs drop the puck again. If you're unsure what the ref says to you, which is common when there's a plexiglass in, in between you and the ref, uh, or when there's complicated penalties being assessed, make sure you confirm the scoring information or the penalty details with the ref before they drop the puck. This is very important because you wanna make sure that the timekeeper is aware of, and the penalty box workers also are aware of when to let those players out of the box. Uh, also, if you are asking about scoring information, a minute and a half later, the refs may not remember those numbers. Also, be sure to double check what you're writing down and where before you do it. I often see scorekeep scorekeepers writing penalties or even goals on the wrong team side and then having to go back and cross those out to rewrite them on the other side. Uh, a little caution will prevent that mistake, especially when you're working in uh, triplicate on these score sheets, uh, you can't really erase. And lastly, at the end of the game, be sure to verify that you've written all the information done correctly and haven't missed any sections or any other pieces of information. I'm going to split the sheet up into these eight different sections and I'll discuss each of them. Mostly I'll try to do them roughly in the order that they'll be filled out during a normal game situation. So here's the new score sheet. As you can see, the various sections have bold headings and then they have thicker lines dividing the different sections from one another. Now let's take a look at the first section of interest on the score sheet. The team info section tells us which teams are playing and everyone who's involved on the team. At the very top, you will write in the names of the home team on the left side and the away team on the right. Please note that on the new game sheets, the home team is listed on the left. On the old central section score sheet, we're accustomed to having the home team on the right side, so just be careful where you put each team. 
The remainder of this section is for the player roster and coach roster. Generally, the scorekeeper does not fill this out, but instead the score sheet's handed off to a team manager or head coach or assistant coach from each team so that they can complete that information. In the players section, write down the jersey number and the name of each player rostered on the team. In the team officials section, write the name of each coach, their CEP number, and the CEP year, along with their CEP level. The head coach also needs to sign the score sheet. One other item of note, technically the CEP year should be written as the year the coach obtained that CEP level. Uh, but that said, almost every coach I've ever seen fills out their expiration year for the CEP year. I've never heard anyone complain about them uh, writing the year down that way, so I'd suggest writing the expiration year. Uh, that just keeps it consistent with what we, what, what we expect to see on a, on a game sheet. Now the full team roster should be listed on every game sheet. That means every player should be listed. If a player is not present or cannot play, they should be scratched by placing a single line through their name, like so. Teams may also use stickers instead of writing this information down. As of this recording, my understanding is that stickers are legal for all games. Uh, this may not necessarily be the case by the time you watch this, uh, or I may be mistaken. So check on the legality of stickers before you use them, especially for state-bound games. Also remember that because the score sheets are in triplicate, you need to put a sticker on each of the three copies, not just the top one. Make sure that your roster stickers stay within the roster section of each page, otherwise the scoring or penalty information not transfer down to the lower sheets. As noted on the slide here, stickers that are two inches by four inches will fit most every game sheet style. The basic match info should probably be the first thing written on each score sheet. The top line has check boxes to indicate what level of play this game is. For Snowbelt League games, be sure to check the box next to Snowbelt. For non-league games with other Snowbelt teams, you can choose Snowbelt or Youth. When playing non-Snowbelt teams, choose Youth. The Tier 1, 2, or 3 options should be used for tournament-bound qualifying games. Also add the date and the start time of the game. Uh, you may want to leave the start time blank so you can write the actual start time if there's any sort of delay. The game number field is for the Snowbelt League games is where you'll put your Snowbelt game code for the league games. In the age classification field, write the age level that's playing, whether it's 10U, 12U, 14U, or you can write Squirt, Pee Wee, Bantam, or Midget. Uh, just as an FYI, uh, USA Hockey officially decided to go with the numbering system 10U, 12U, 14U, and we decided to officially not be using Squirt, Pee Wee, Bantam. If you write it down, I don't think it's going to be a huge problem. Lastly, in the arena field, you'll write the arena or rink name, and if you have more than one rink, you may want to write uh, the particular rink that you'll be playing the game in. Before the game starts, you should print your name in the official scorer field. Also make sure that the person running the clock prints their name in the timekeeper field. Note that there's no need to sign your name anymore, uh, just make sure you print your names legibly. Since the timekeeper doesn't need to sign, uh, you can write their name in. You don't have to make them physically write their name in that field. And then the remainder of that section will be filled out by the on ice officials, usually at the conclusion of the game. We'll skip over that section since it's the ref's duty to fill that out correctly. You should be tracking the shots and saves every game so that you can properly fill out the goalie save section. The shot tracker at the bottom of the score sheet helps you keep track of those. This is perhaps the one section of the score sheet that you could elect to leave blank if you prefer to track shots on a separate sheet of paper or if you prefer to just have them up on your scoreboard. My suggestion is that you fill, the, fill out the shot tracker on the score sheet since it's the easiest way to ensure the shot and save data doesn't get lost since it's right here on the score sheet. Here's a common question new parents have. What exactly is a shot? In youth hockey, we're only concerned with shots on goal. A shot on goal is any shot that directs the puck toward the net such that it would enter the net for a goal. There are only two outcomes from a shot on goal. 
Either it enters the goal, or the goalie blocks it, deflects it, catches it, covers it, or somehow prevents it from entering the goal. If it enters the goal, obviously, that's a goal. If the goalie prevents it from entering the net, that's a save. The easiest way to determine if there was a save is to ask, if the goalie wasn't there, would there have been a goal? If the answer is yes, then it, that was a save. If the answer is no, then that was not a shot on goal. Keep in mind, if another player other than the goalie blocks the puck, or if the puck hits part of the crossbar and deflects away, those do not count as shots on goal. Additionally, if the puck is sailing wide right and the goalie catches it anyway, that's also not a shot on goal. Professional hockey has all sorts of shot sets for those various instances, but at youth hockey, we aren't concerned with those. When it comes to the score sheet, we're only concerned with shots on goal and whether those resulted in a save or a goal. When marking the shot tracker, you'll want to mark saves and goals differently. The standard has been adopted is uh, that for saves, you'll put a diagonal slash through the number, and for goals, you circle the number. At the end of the, each period, put a vertical line between the two numbers to separate each period's shot totals. This will come in useful for when you're filling out the goalie save section later. If there's a goalie switch during the game, you may want to also put an additional vertical line to designate how many shots the first goalie faced compared with how many shots the second goalie faced. In the example here, we have reached the end of the first period and the goalie faced 10 shots, allowing two goals on the sixth and the 10th shots. Note, if a team manages to take more than 40 shots, you'll need to add additional numbers in the remarks section to continue tracking. The scoring summary section is crucial to fill out correctly. As you can see, the new score sheet now has the goal numbers marked to the left of each goal. This will make it easier to ensure you have the correct score, particularly for high scoring games. If a team happens to score more than 16 goals, I would suggest writing down the additional goals on a separate sheet of paper. At the conclusion of the game, see if there are enough blank lines in the remarks section or the penalty section to denote any additional goals. When you do so, make sure you include all the information you would have written in the scoring summary section and clearly label that misplaced information so everyone knows what it is. The reason I suggest that you write the goals on a separate piece of paper is in case something happens and you need to, to use the space in the remarks section or if you get a lot of penalties and you need those lines, uh, then you will, you will have that uh, available to you. At the conclusion of the game, you'll know where you have available space. If all else fails and you don't have space anywhere, write the goal info on the backside of all three copies and note that in the remarks section. In the period column, obviously you'll put a one, two, or three, depending on which period the goal is scored in. And if the goal is scored in overtime, you'll mark OT. In the time column, you will mark down the time of the goal. In youth hockey, we just mark down what's called the clock time. Whatever time is displayed on the, on the time clock is the time you'll write down. There's no need to do any math for that, trying to figure out how far into the period you are. For the G column, you'll mark down the jersey number of the player credited with the goal. In the two assist column, you'll put down the jersey numbers of the players credited with the assist. After a goal, one of the refs will tell you who they're crediting with the goal. They might say 42 unassisted, in which case you'll put 42 in the goal column and just hash marks or, or dashes in the assist column to denote no assist. Or they may say 16 from 17 from 16 and 18, in which case you'll put 17 in the goals column and then 16 and 18 in each of the assist column. The penalty section is another crucial section of the score sheet, both during and after a game. You may need to refer back to this section during the game to determine the proper time to let a player out of the box. There are five columns in the penalty section. In the first two columns, you'll write down the period number and the clock time of the penalty. For the clock time, you'll write down the clock time at the time the ref announces the penalty to you. If the ref raises his hand at 10 minutes on the clock and the play continues until 9.15 remains on the clock, you'll write 9.15 in the time column because that's when he's telling you the penalty. In the length column, 
you'll write the full penalty length for the penalty according to the rules you're playing under. So for most teams, if it's a minor penalty, you would write down two minutes for the length of the penalty. Squirts would write down a minute 30 since they only serve a minute and a half for their minor, minor penalties. For the purposes of this video, I will use two minutes because it's easier to say. <laughs> Just know that at the squirt level, it would be a minute 30. So if a goal is scored 10 seconds into the resulting power play and the penalized player is only in the box for 10 seconds, you'll still write down two minutes in the length column. Even if a penalty is called and the other team scores before the whistle blows, that player may not serve or even enter the penalty box at all, but you'll still write two minutes in the length column. Don't write zero and don't write a line. Because they were assessed with a minor penalty, you should write down two minutes. And if the refs call a minor penalty but award the team a penalty shot, you guessed it, you'll still write down two minutes in the length field. In the number field, write down the jersey number of the player penalized. Even if another player is serving the penalty, the number column should have the penalized player's jersey number, not the player serving the penalty. If there's a bench penalty, such as too many men or delay of game, write the jersey number of the player serving the penalty. The remarks section is one feature that central section has had and makes great use of. This section is used for any necessary explanations that may not be included in the sections we've already covered. On the new version of the score sheet, the timeout option is built right in. So if a timeout is called, just check the appropriate period on the bottom line and write the clock time. Due to the, all the other additions on the score sheet, we have less space for the remarks now on this new version than on our previous score sheet. There should still be enough space for the vast majority of situations. Scorekeepers during the game can note any goalie changes during the game here in the remarks section. Some scorekeepers also note which player may serve a major or minor penalty that's paired with a misconduct. On-ice officials will also need this space to write any game misconduct details at the conclusion of the game. They're required to write the name, number, and rule number for any game misconducts that are given out. Before the game, team managers may also include details about players who are serving game misconduct suspensions or who may be out due to injury. Any other miscellaneous information about the game may also be added here, but try to make sure it's relevant to the game. These two sections are often incorrectly left blank. Don't forget that when the final buzzer sounds, you still have more work to do. For the scoring by periods and goalie save sections, the easiest way to handle these is to fill in the period stats at the end of each period instead of waiting for the end of the game to do all the work. The scoring by period section is pretty straightforward. You'll mark down how many goals were scored in each period by each team. If there was no overtime, you can leave it blank or put a dash in that box. The total for each team should be the final score. Of course, the number in the total field should equal the sum of all the periods and should also match how many goals are noted in the scoring section. Be sure to fill out the goalie save section on every score sheet. This stat is important to go coaches, goalies, and goalie parents. A team might lose 4-0, to zero, but if the goalie had 45 saves, then he can still know he did a pretty good job. Think of it like this. For goalies, leaving this section blank is pretty much like not marking down who scored goals and assists during the game. This section does require some amount of basic math. Remember, you're not marking down shots, but saves. The easiest way to do this is to take the number of shots for a given period and subtract the number of goals for that period. That will be the number of saves. Or I know some of you prefer to avoid possible math mistakes. So if you use the shot tracker at the bottom of the score sheet, you can simply count the number of slashes for each period to find out the number of saves. Just remember to ignore the O's since those are goals. As I mentioned before, doing this math is easier to do at the conclusion of each period instead of trying to figure it all out at the end when the refs are waiting for you to, to finish the score sheet so they can sign off. Unfortunately, there was not enough space to include two lines for each goalie in the case of a goalie switch. If this goalie switch happens during the middle of a period, you may want to split the period into two save numbers, one for each goalie. 
I'm not sure if this is correct, but the method I personally prefer is to mark the two numbers with a slash between them. Again, it may be easiest for you to write down the first number at the time of the goalie switch, so you're not stuck trying to figure this all out later. Here's an example of an actual score sheet that's filled out nearly perfectly. Let's just review. You'll see that each team wrote their team names in the proper spot at the top. Fulton hand wrote their complete roster and scratched the two players that were not present. Corning used a sticker for their roster that includes the jersey numbers and the, and the player names. The coaches' names, CEP numbers, levels, and years are included, and the head coaches signed off. Note that Corning used a sticker and crossed off the coach who was not present. Also note that even though they used a sticker, their head coach did sign the score sheet. The match info was completely filled out. Since this was a Snowbelt League game, they checked the Snowbelt box and wrote the league game code. They also included the rest of the information here. Always remember to print your name in the scorer box. Since signatures are no longer required, you can also print the name of the timekeeper as well. Make sure you include first and last names and write legibly. The shot tracker was filled out appropriately too. You can see that Fulton ended up with 47 shots, so it was necessary to continue the shot tracking in the remarks section. As we discussed before, the saves are denoted with slashes and goals with circles. Also take note that the horizontal lines were added to separate the shots from period to period. The scoring sections were also filled out correctly with all relevant information included. Same goes for the penalty section. Note that the infractions are written legibly. This is important. There wasn't a need for many remarks in this game, but you'll see that the home team used the space for the extra shot tracking and the away team timeout was noted. The scoring by period section was also filled out accurately and you can verify all this information by reviewing the scoring sections for each team. Likewise, the goalie save section was filled out accurately, and you can also verify this information by reviewing the shot tracker information at the bottom of the score sheet. Lastly, the scorekeepers had the refs sign off on the score sheet. You'll notice that the refs did not initial the sheet like they should have, and the second official signed instead of printing their name. This is not really the scorekeeper's mistake, although it may be useful to note any errors to the refs before they leave. They may or may not care, but you'll have done your part, and it's not your mistake. So that about wraps it up for this presentation. Hopefully this will be useful for everyone, but especially new parents who are interested in learning to take on the scorekeeper duties for their team. Here are a few resources in case you'd like them. The Office Officiating Manual was written back in 2011, but it's still an amazing resource. I'd strongly suggest that anyone who works in the penalty box or as a scorekeeper or timekeeper should take the time to read it. Thanks again for taking the time to watch through this entire video. I hope you and your players have successful, fun, and safe hockey careers. Thanks again.